Okay, welcome back then. Early April 1858. I thought I'd kind of uh, do I'd, I'd do a kind of spring quarterly report in April um, as opposed to uh, March, just because there's a couple of things I wanted to just check unfold to see what uh, what would happen. And, and um, well, I'll follow up uh, on that in a moment. Before I forget, someone did ask um, in the comments about something, and that was the Hungarian Army Corps. Um, how it how it is that you can kind of capture army corps and what the mechanics are and this kind of thing now in terms of the mechanics i don't know if it's a bug or not i don't think that it is i'll explain why but i suspect that it's not I, i'm not someone that reads game code or anything like that you know i know it's kind of flavor of the month and that is something that people tend to do and you know uh someone who does that can i'm sure determine whether or not it's intentional or not but um i'm fine if it is a bug uh, and it's it's uh, completely within the realms of plausibility and it's something that happens and uh, it doesn't ha i mean it happened in real life of course and happened even in the 20th century you can get an army corps comprised of you know prisoners of war and disaffected kind of um disaffected people from a particular ethnic group and this kind of thing so i really like it um and i don't know whether or not it's a function of the fact that you can for example capture uh, supply wagons and other kinds of war material so for example guns and this kind of thing and repurpose those things and i don't think you can do i've i, I don't think you can do it with brigades and divisions maybe you can but I, i've not experienced that but for uh, for the most part it's uh, it happens very rarely but you uh, if an army corps is completely destroyed an enemy army corps but you manage to capture a portion of its hq unit i don't think it's always the case but i think in some cases you uh, may be able to reconstruct an army corps around that hq service asset unit which is this force here uh, which is exactly what happened to us and again i quite like it i think it's really really good there are differences for example between a, um, um, an army corps from a foreign state comprised of say volunteers which is only ever going to be a very small portion of your your standing army or even a small portion of uh, all groups from this kind of, you know, all soldiers from this ethnic group. Overwhelmingly, these troops are going to be fighting for the Austrian Empire. Um, but there are differences. Um, the command points required to lead for an officer, for a senior Ottoman officer to lead this uh, uh, infantry corps, uh, it would be much more, that they would need much more than, than to um, lead like an Ottoman infantry corps, which leads me to suspect that it is, in fact, not a bug and entirely intentional. Um, and... I like that. You would not be able to. You would not be able to stack three of these together to comprise an army because the command point, the, the command points required would just be too much. As such, um, kind of free army corps, uh, that is to say, army corps from a foreign nation that you've kind of managed to reconstruct around, say, a HQ unit comprised of senior officers who have given you an offer of service. Uh, these formations really can only ever function independently or as a garrisoning force or some kind of rear echelon force or something like this. It may be mentioned in the manual. I mean, the manual is available as a PDF online. You can sort of Google it and have a look at it. I have read, read it in, in, in its entirety. I can't remember even whether this is, this is mentioned. I have read it entirely at some point, and then I've kind of revisited it to try and find specific things. And it may be mentioned. If it did, it certainly kind of washed over me, um, and I, I don't sort of I don't remember. Uh, but there are lots of features of the game that just aren't really addressed in the manual anyway. So I would suggest that if it is not mentioned in the manual, this is in no way significant. Um, but the more that I play um, games like Pride of Nations and age odd games more generally, especially older age odd games, it feels like the longer you kind of play these games, the more you peel away a new layer. And, and over a period of time, realize that these games are actually like very subtly developed, uh, very kind of complex, rich, layered, textured kind of military system uh, that I would say surpasses in complexity and realism uh, the military systems that you find in most modern ground strategy games to tell you the truth that uh, and as such i would deduce from that also that it's probably intentional uh, that it is not an accident it may have even stemmed from a bug it may have stemmed from the fact that as a you know a, as a function of capturing war material they couldn't figure out a way for you not to catch your army corps and so they just um kind of uh, dealt with that by um requiring such an army corps to have a really large um command point kind of allotment you know which is to say that you couldn't comprise an entire army or you couldn't make an entire army comprised of captured army corps because it just wouldn't be viable i think the thing that that would reflect of course is the fact that even with junior officers and ncos they just come from a different military tradition 
in many cases there are language barriers now okay you could say with austria well it's a multi-ethnic multilingual empire but of course they would have developed their own very specific systems to overcome that uh, which would not necessarily have been the same systems that existed in the ottoman empire which is also a multi-ethnic and multilingual empire although in any case i've probably suggested in the ottoman empire there would have been a kind of preponderance of uh, of, of educated people that would have spoken um, Turkish, Arabic, and probably Greek, you know, uh, uh, much more so, much more likely, I think, this than, hung, than Austrian officers, uh, educated Austrians being able to speak Hungarian or Croat or whatever. But in any case, it's sort of moot because, uh, yeah, they, they would have all found, they would have all developed their own different systems and methods of kind of um, of overcoming this language barrier this kind of command language barrier so i would suggest that it's intentional and that you i don't again i don't know whether it's uh, it's tied to the numbers of prisoners of war you have it doesn't happen too often often you can fight very very long wars where you don't really ever construct an army corps of kind of uh, foreign volunteers but uh, it's yeah you essentially capture the staff command and around that you're able to flesh out um a command thing but I, again i think it's really really good it's one of the reasons why i love these kind of these kind of older ground strategy games you know and you sort of think like um i mean pride of nations is not even a completely it's not even a military strategy game you know it's a grand strategy game um, that contains a really complex and elaborate military characteristics because that's mostly agiod specialization and i think older agiod games are great as well i mean agiod still sort of exists within the confines of sort of slytherin and sort of enfolded to slytherin i'd argue that probably since that Maybe a lot of the kind of quirkiness, you know, and, and the sort of rawness of AGO games have kind of been stifled. And the older games were maybe a little bit better. That's, you know, different folks, different strokes. But I think that's, that is a feature generally of older grand strategy games also. I mean, if you compare something like this to, to like a modern military grand strategy game, going off a bit of a tangent here, but why not? Um, we, uh, we're eight years in. <laughs> Time to hit the pulpit. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you compare it to like a modern grand strategy game, military grand strategy game, like, you know, like a leading one. If you go to Steam, look at the top sellers, I bet you, uh, like Hearts of Iron 4, something like that is going to be in the top five, right? Not a bad game. It's good fun. There's nothing really wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with liking it or anything like that. But you look at that and it's purely a military strategy game. That is just a military strategy game that focuses specifically <coughs> on recreating the, you know, the kind of uh, the Second World War. And they've only really just begun to introduce a supply logistics system of rolling stock that is even comparable to Pride of Nations, which is like a decade old, you know. And I would say also that it's not terribly good, that they've not done a really great job in it. I mean, the Second World War is a hard conflict, even though it's the most commonly depicted conflict in grand strategy games. It's a tough one to, it's a tough one to depict, because you've got a faction that, through the use of very novel, new kind of tactics, combined arms and stuff like this, is able to, you know, produce incredible kind of results in the first part of the conflict against opponents that have some sort of force parity, and in, in some, some cases have much larger armies, and that's a hard thing to kind of you know to, to depict and they do that through the doctrine system in a way that is arguably fairly unimaginative but in any case uh, the other thing also of course is manpower like i love the fact that in in like this game age of games you don't just have raw manpower that you can just you know draw on um in this abstract way as is the case really i think uh, in like hearts of iron uh, actually you have to convert that manpower into a kind of standing reserve and into that's one of the problems that germany of course had in real life they had plenty of manpower but they just didn't have a large standing reserve because they never had much of a large standing army prior to the refounding of the, the armed forces in 35 but um older older grand strategy games for the win all the way i'm an absolute hardliner you know and you even think i'm gonna you know i'm being tough on, on like paradox but when you go back to when like paradox for example was a kind of you know like an indie sort of small swedish kind of independent like uh you know uh, grand strategy get labeled their games were, were absolutely wonderful they were really really great you know, you look at, uh, at like, and like, yeah, of course they were really clunky because they were made by like, a small independent company. You know, they were really, really clunky. The interface was clunky as hell. They were probably a bit more superficial in a lot of ways. Like, um, but their shtick was kind of real time grand strategy and, uh, you know, in a world of principally turn based grand strategy. So it meant that they kind of sacrificed a bit of complexity for a real time experience and tended to offset that through like really, really rich kind of like a really rich layered historical kind of content so you look at something like european Versailles 2 for example you know you've got like different music with each you know uh you know sort of period correct music from each century that you pass through and you've got loads of historical events pop up that you read and and all this kind of thing and it really like it, these these earlier games you know european Versailles 2 um you know victoria vicky ricky um even complete turkeys like you know european of Asylus rome which was a steaming jobby but i've still spent like a thousand hours playing it and i probably wouldn't do that with most modern grand strategy games all of these games uh 
even the bad ones, um, you could just tell they were made by people that really cared about history and they were deeply interested in history. And that, that really shone through, you know, that really, really. Uh, and I would, I would pick that even a turkey like over most modern games. Most modern games, even by the same companies that have grown and sprawled into much bigger entities, are. I would argue, um, you know, like the historical feature of their game is merely incidental to the kind of trajectory of that company uh, as having, you know, been a company that just puts out historically themed games. That's just their market. Anyway, um, I'm going on for a tangent of a rant, and uh, yeah, we have to. After eight years, it, it was time that I, uh, you know, <laughs> a bit of vitriol, a bit of a uh, bit of um, spleen venting. Um, but yeah, I hope in the longest conceivable way possible that answers the question. Uh, with regard to um, free army corps, um, yeah, I, whether it's a bug or not, I don't even mind. Uh, I don't think that it is. I suspect that it isn't, but maybe it is. Um, uh, but it completely works. It's within the realms of historical plausibility. It completely stacks up, and the fact that it has the special characteristic of requiring more command points, I think, makes it, um, you know, a really, really good idea, and it works really, really well. And you know, in this case, we've been a beneficiary. I think one thing we can explore this together because um, I, uh, it's been a while actually, but I think. I'm not sure if you could really modify them or anything like that. I think they kind of exist in a sort of cryostasis in terms of the sort of um, the, the, the character of their weapons and equipment and stuff like that. And that being the case, within a decade or so, we will probably have to dissolve the unit. Um, but we'll keep an eye on that. And who knows? Maybe there'll be opportunities down the line to acquire other sort of free army corps if we can kind of uh, win the service of some senior officers. So... Um, before I f forgot, I wanted to kind of address that, and yeah, we're not, we're not going to put a bit of a tangent there. It has been a really, really good winter. Um, I was quite worried, um, just after the war, in the immediate aftermath of the war, after about a month, um, there was a sudden dramatic drop-off in exports. And this happened about five years ago. This is something that kind of keeps me up at night a little bit the reason being is because it, i always kind of wonder whether or not it's indicative of some kind of looming economic crisis and that is a feature of this game and it's a feature that it is very very good it's done very well but it is something of concern um i think the mechanics for that which is quite realistic it's sort of a crisis of overproduction it's just when too many goods are being produced in all the different factions by all the different kind of workers i suppose and you just can't sell those, you know, you, uh, the more goods and services are produced than you can sell back to the workforce, essentially. And what begins to happen is the markets kind of like, the markets reach a ceiling and the AI capitalists, really specifically, and with good reason, just won't invest in RGOs, in, agri you know, in industrial enterprises that don't offer a prospect of return. So you start having capital accumulation. And that's the catalyst, really, capital accumulation. They start hoarding capital. I think I mentioned this in a previous video. Once it reaches, I think, an average of about 2,000 per faction. I'm not sure if it's every faction on Earth or like the top eight factions or something like that. That can serve as a catalyst. There's a probability. It's like a die roll. Each turn, there's a possibility that one of those factions... Uh, will trigger an economic crisis. Economic crises can vary in intensity and length, um, but are characterized by the kind of things one might imagine. High inflation, uh, declining domestic demand, declining exports, um, all those kinds of things, you know, at the very least sluggish growth or, you know, like sort of economic contraction. And it can be, it can be a really, really difficult time. Um, they, again, they can vary in intensity and they will last at least six months. They can last longer. Um, and I always, I do, I do always tend to have a bit of a kind of, a, I tend to keep an eye out for them. There's not much you can do really in terms of sort of like uh, preparing for these things, but I, I tend to rather keep an eye out, uh, you know, and think well if, if exports are kind of dropping off. Anyway, it was a bit of a kind of um, a misplaced concern in this case. It is something that we would expect at some point. We're eight years into the game, you know, nearly a, nearly a decade, uh, nearly the first decade is done, and we haven't had any kind of major economic crisis, no recessions, anything like this. So. It may be something that will be on the cards at some point. But I kind of thought, damn, the war has just ended. We've got all this state revenue. We've got all this, you know, like uh, all these raw materials. Everything's coming together, you know, guaranteed I'm going to have an economic crisis now. But, as I say, a misplaced concern. Exports are starting to pick up. And, yeah, the, the economy is in pretty good shape, you know. Um, I've got the exports set for the next turn. Let's have a quick look, actually. I'll make a bit of a break with tradition and start with kind of... Um, Approximate economic indices. We're always shifting around 100 to 105 goods um, worth around 300. Well, this, I mean, domestic domestic consumption is even increasing. You know, 300 to 360 now. Um, this is average. You know, uh, and and obviously national market sales, domestic market sales 
are much more static, are much more consistent, really, I should say, um, than exports. Exports can fluctuate dramatically. Exports have started picking up, and the thing that uh, that is really interesting is one of our <laughs> one of our customers is Austria. Austria is hauling in a lot of textiles, tobacco, and you know it's almost like Austria has become this kind of you know like vulnerable economic entity that's dependent on imports. I can't imagine why that is. I cannot imagine why that is, but it's good to see. Uh, really consistent market as also France. I mean, keep an eye on France and little powers as well. You know, Denmark, Belgium tend to crop up on the list. But yeah, it's looking really, really good. I've managed to kind of scale the imports down now to ensure that we are really just meeting demand and a little bit on top of that. You know, I went a little bit crazy to begin with. It didn't really calibrate imports properly, and we were probably spending a bit too much on them. It's not money wasted because those commodities sit in the, sit in the stockpile. And we gradually kind of eat through those. But the economy is looking in really, really good shape. We've extended, we've begun the extension. So we've got a rail line now in construction through Zondalak, uh, which will link up the coal mine there. And obviously we'll, we'll develop a kind of system around the coal mine to increase efficiency through um, Ankara in, you know, sort of central Anatolia, really. Coal mine and um, coal extraction site being developed there. And then the last stretch of that will link up to Sinop. So we've now got, you know, a nice section of rail line, um, you know, really going right in to kind of central Anatolia. And that's good to see. And that's kind of halfway to the Russian frontier. Um, Sinop is an important location, I think. It's got a dramatic, you know, really, really rapidly growing uh, population. I've got some small um, industrial enterprises there at the moment, just a can good shop. But that is a candidate second tier, along with, uh, re I'd say it's a second tier city. So probably uh, on, on par with Smyrna. It's about half the size of Smyrna. Uh, um, but it's, yeah, it's a size four city, and then you've, we've also got Salonica. Salonica, you know, will hold off a little bit. The, the concern with European cities is their kind of vulnerability, how productive they're going to be, are they going to be prone to strikes and stuff like this, you know. So the focus is on kind of developing uh, central and western Anatolia. And, we, and I mentioned in the last video, we're seeing a really, really nice demographic expansion. Just in the last couple of terms, we've said uh, Constantinople has gone up to size 12 now, Smyrna's up to eight. We've got the foundation of a city in Izmit, which instantly went up to two. So really, really, really kind of like, you know, really, really fast growing kind of area of this. And that's going to be on the back of industrialization, of course, you know, like people will flood into towns and cities looking for work. But yeah, the economy is going really, really good. In terms of our army reform plan, that is going ahead. Now, we kind of added a bolt on to that, which I mentioned before we might do. And the bolt on is it seemed silly, really, that we would subtract two army corps from both the kind of uh, European army under um, Hussein. Uh, Avni and the well, well, basically the second and third army, and Hussein and then the eastern army under Abdi Pasha, and just dissolve those forces. Why would we do that? You know, our army in 1850 was basically we patched together enough forces to field two meaningfully coherent field armies. We tried to kind of improvise a third army towards the end of the Russian war. That was only really complete, uh, really in the opening stages of the war with Austria where we managed to bring together an additional army comprised of three army corps. I think it was two army corps and plus two infantry divisions, which is about the size of an army corps, plus cavalry and so on. But we eventually formed that into a proper... That was That's actually Hussein Avni's force. We created three armies. So well, we, we created one entirely new army, and we brought the army from the east in. And that allowed us to concentrate, I should say, three armies in the European theatre. The idea is, really, from uh, by... Uh, the construction of by the expansion of the imperial guard this will allow us to really furnish a fourth army in central anatolia that fourth army is going to be under the command of um abdi uh, abdi pasha and um we already have two army corps basically um which we've, we've we've gone into ankara and what we need to do now is to build an additional guard corps what this basically means is that the ottoman filled army will have doubled in size. By 1860, it would have doubled in size since 1850. And the Imperial Guard component of that will have quadrupled in size. So it's a significant kind of like um, quantitative expansion. And we're doubling the size of the army. And we're in a position to do that now. But also a massive qualitative increase. It, and uh, we will definitely still have an, a, an Imperial Guard Corps for the 4th Army. The reason being, as, as I mentioned, the idea is to try and have every single field command organise uh, around a shock formation. A part of this also is that as the Ottoman Empire, there's limits to what we can do with the Ottoman Empire. There are certain kinds of limits. We're always going to be a little bit technologically backward, or at the very least kind of playing catch up. And it means that if there's any kind of like technique or kind of technological edge that maybe a kind of, you know, Western or, or Northern European power, even Austria, 
may develop this can be always kind of mitigated by the fact that you know we're probably going to have a much larger imperial guard uh you know we're going to have something like i say sort of something kind of uh, almost analogous to the janissaries we have a large professional core uh, or elites not just professional because it's a professional standing army that we have in only but an elite shock force around which every field command is organized all this stuff comes at expense imperial guard corps are really expensive to build in lots of different ways they're expensive and we, you know we have poured huge amounts of state revenue into doing this but we had a lot of state revenue accumulated at the end of the austrian war we still have good, good amounts of state revenue um it requires a lot of manufactured goods and uh, guard corps are especially officer heavy they require a lot of kind of educated uh, you know middle class upper middle class aristocrats and this kind of thing and and uh that part of our population is expanding also so we can kind of draw on more educated people uh to be able to staff these kind of guard corps they require a lot of officers so there's the initial kind of cost then there's the maintenance cost expanding the army to basically have four field commands will require just more state revenue to maintain more manufactured goods to maintain more manpower really for replacements and things like this um and the other cost really the uh, the, the cost which is unquantifiable is that it does impose pressures on our foreign, uh, our foreign relations. It will result in an atrophying of foreign relations. You can even see with it's gone on a few points with Britain. Our relations with Britain are still very, very good. But with France, there's this kind of pressure um, on, on foreign relations. Uh, and foreign powers are very sensitive to kind of like, you know, big increases in armaments, large army expansions. And our army would have doubled. You know, we, did, we built a third army at the end of the Russia war, finished that at the beginning of the... Um, of, of the, the beginning of the Austrian war and now we're building a fourth army doubling the size of the Ottoman army quadrupling the size of the Imperial Guard and that's not even mentioning the uh, the fleet expansion and the fleet expansion is going ahead and it's going really really well so we've got four squadrons of screw corvettes these are the first of their kind these screw corvettes screw corvettes um are the latest kind of corvette design it means that they still have auxiliary sails they have you can see from the picture they have all the kind of sails that traditional age of sails have they've got the bow sprit you know the mainmast the mizzen mast all that stuff but really these masts the, the, the sails are kind of um the auxiliary sails it's mostly screw propulsion but the sails are allowed um allow the ships to, to, to move even faster i suppose we're moving downwind or a beam's reach or whatever um so the, like the, the sails still come in handy but for the for the most part these are these are you know they're propelled by a screw and we've uh so we've got four is it four uh eight nine eleven twelve we've got twelve in construction four of them the first squadron are virtually complete and we're going to be building um an additional squadron of an additional four screw corvettes now these three are basically going to be joining the raiding fleet which is based here and then this fleet is going to be split into two with um a uh, a, a, a squadron of uh frigates traditional frigates which is slightly heavier than corvettes frigates that they could frigates can range quite dramatically in terms of their size the, you know the numbers of guns and this kind of thing but the, for the most part they're heavier than corvettes so each kind of um flotilla each raiding fleet, which will be comprised of, you know, um, I guess eight, nine, ten, twelve, uh, about twelve ships, twelve to twelve to sixteen ships. Uh, each one will have um, a squadron of frigates, and the additional flotilla will come under the command, of course, as mentioned, of Mushia Pasha. Now there will be an additional squadron of screw corvettes. That squadron will join the main Imperial fleet. The reason being is one thing that I've noticed is that we're struggling to spot and engage enemy formations. That's going to be due to, to smaller forces, you know, smaller, uh, smaller, lighter ships. Obviously, they're faster. They're quite good for spotting, and they're screen screening as well. They're really good for screening. Uh, so, getting scouting and lighter kind of um, ships will increase the spotting li spotting likelihood. Uh, the ability for our main fleet to actually spot. And then move on to engage and also protect the heavy ships we've often received damage to our to kind of to our sort of uh ship of the lines of which we have eight and a lot of that is just due to the fact that perhaps we don't have a large enough screen so we'll add four screw corvettes uh to the main fleet also that's pretty much it in terms of military business that is that is it the military forms going ahead with this is the uh this is the second guard corps that we built the first one has already joined um hussein avenue uh the next one is moving east uh, to join uh, Abdul Karim Nadir's force, we've already subtracted his army corps. Now we have had the creation of two new um, two-star generals. The first one 
we sent uh, to join Hussein Avni's force. This is a two-star general. Now, each formation will have at least one two-star general. That two-star general, in the event of uh, of, of kind of um, of operations, will always be given command of the Imperial Guard. This will allow the Imperial Guard to always be subtracted from the main field command and function independently if required. Whether it's not to secure the rear, to press some kind of advantage, to hold a flank, something like this. Uh, so we'll always have a two-star general in every field command. In some cases, it'll be a three-star general that will be given direct command of the Imperial Guard. With often the majority of the other forces functioning as in, independent forces within the command, if you like. Uh, so we've got uh, Namik Pasha, who's our newest two-star general. He replaces Ismail Pasha, who retired. And in the east, actually, I think we actually we, we put him into the new formation. Yeah, and Hussein uh, Pasha. Not Hussein Avni Pasha. No relation. Not the same picture. Not a bug. Um, just Hussein Pasha. So, uh, I guess just a common name. Again, a two-star general. And he'll be given, be given command of the Imperial Guard once that is formed in Avni Pasha's 4th Army. Avni Pasha's 4th Army, I think, will maintain as a base, a base central Anatolia. In the event of operations against, for example, Russia, we'll have um, Omar Pasha's force in Adrianople. Hussein Avni's force in Sofia can move north to engage and this will constitute well there's two options we can constant we can keep Avdi Pasha as a reserve force around Constant Constantinople to kind of counter um, landings or anything like this or attempted moves you know amphibious sort of landings um, or indeed we can send his force east uh, to double the size of the forces that we have in the east which is super spot here that there's a Russian formation on the border to double the number of forces we have in the east which means that we can actually then begin to consider uh, more aggressive offensive actions in the southern Caucasus, maybe with a view to sort of taking Baku, damaging fortresses, destroying depots, destroying staging points. We will obviously firm up a proper plan uh, for war against Russia, as I said, suggested that we would at some point this year. We'll develop a proper plan so that we know what to do in the event uh, of a war with Russia. Now, in terms of wars, we can obviously begin to see Russian forces kind of emerging on our border. That doesn't necessarily mean very much, but it is the first time in a while. We don't exactly know this here, this is Prince someone, um, but that looks like a fairly substantial command. We don't know what it's comprised of, there's no real details, but in any case, uh, there is a, um, a foot, what appears to be a fairly substantial Russian force in Aravan. It might mean nothing, it might mean everything. Um, you know, we sort of dare them to come on, really, um, frankly. Um, well, I'd, to tell you the truth, I'd rather peace. We've, we've been a war twice against you know two major powers um, this decade. It's bonkers. Uh, the Russians, of course, are still tied up um, in Sweden very much. They are, they are winning that war. They hold they hold Stockholm. I don't think they have any territorial claims in Sweden. So I gather I gather the only kind of um, yeah, I mean, what you know, what kind of concessions can they press for? Um, military transit rights, reparations. I don't know. Um, but yeah, for whatever reason. Russia was bent on, on, on bringing Sweden to heel. Now, talking of wars, just this term, peace has broken out between Austria and uh, Piedmont Sardinia. And Austria at one point retook uh, Milan and then it, it refell to Piedmont Sardinia. And uh, it's a victory for Piedmont Sardinia. It's not quite the staggering, overwhelming victory that we, in, uh, that, that we kind of enjoyed. Well, the, at least in terms of the damage that we inflicted on Austria. Um, but this suggests i mean i think milan is the biggest city um in italy actually and it's a fairly industrial developed city uh, it's got some nice rgos um it's got a railway running through it this really rather suggests that italy is on on course for unification it's not a sure thing yet i mean pm not suddenly are still under control um you know a corner of the italian peninsula it will be at the wealthiest the most developed corner but um this doesn't bode well for Austria trying to maintain the status quo in the Italian peninsula. But war has broken out. I mean, we can see that uh, Piedmont Sardinia get Milan. We don't know what the other provisions are, whether Austria is also compelled to dole out money to them. But Austria is at peace now for the first time in some years. We can see the construction of something outside Zagreb. So we can already see the attempts to kind of ease some economic recovery. It'll take them a long time, a long old time to recover the position they were in. We've just did so much damage. It's unbelievable. So we'll keep a careful eye. And Austria. Austria is at peace in what has been an absolutely disastrous five years for them, and, and, and of their own making, frankly. But we'll keep a careful eye on Austria, because we don't want Austria to get you know, into the same kind of position it was before the war. It's a very strong, imposing, threatening nation to us. And of course, there's a good chance that next time it goes to war with us, we'll not be at a time that is convenient for us. We might be tied up elsewhere, who knows, against Russia. And indeed, uh, it's not necessarily the case 
uh, that Piedmont, Sardinia, will be fighting Russia next time, or, or, or Austria next time, I should say. And even if they are, that they do necessarily very well. So, keeping an eye on Austria, and maybe even looking at the dismantling as, of Austria as a long-term, sort of, um, desirable geopolitical outcome, does make sense, I think. Like, it's in a weak position, allow it to recover and become very, very powerful, and a threat again isn't necessarily, um, you know, uh, good for us. So we'll keep an eye on its kind of uh, economic recovery and, and we'll see what happens. We have got another revolt in Lebanon. Um, I mean, I, I gather they're Christians in Lebanon. Uh, no outcry in the Western press this time. No kind of hideous sort of overstepping of the mark by local governors that's upsetting, you know, the, the, the sort of chattering classes in the West. But we are moving to deal with it. Now, one of the divisions that we had sort of spare are placed in Damascus. In a, in a, as a really a permanent force, it's quite slow moving. It turns out that um, Lebanon is quite hilly, the weather's quite tough there for the time being. That's affecting our ability to respond. As such, I took the measure of also embarking the Benghazi Brigade. Its station is usually in Benghazi in Libya. Kind of did pretty much exactly what we did actually with during the Maronite Rebellion, just to move two forces into place uh, to just really ensure. Because I don't know at the moment there's been no response from the West, but. My anxiety is that this will become a focal point once again, especially of France. You know, we don't want the French kind of getting sort of um, embroiled and involved in our business. Um, we've also received reports of a rebellion. Well, first of all, in Kut, and we can see that there is some disputed ownership here. There's rebels. We moved the uh, Baghdad division uh, to Kut, and there was nothing there. And then I can see in Kabala, there's also a question of disputed ownership. So it looks like we've got small insurgent forces hopping across the kind of, um, you know, the Tigris and the Euphrates, causing many trouble. We'll zero in on this force and, and ultimately look to kind of uh, destroy it and restore control, full control, I should say, uh, to central Iraq. The situation in Aden is much as it has been, you know. Uh, we're focusing on a local chief bribing operation, which also has the effect of increasing loyalty, and you know it's a kind of an adjunct to that. That, that also drives down um, uh, sort of insurgency risks and revolt risks. We have tried to conduct a couple of military expeditions in those tiles where we have forces. Those things don't necessarily work, by the way. Not all things that you play work. There's a kind of probability, and in this case, both of those things failed. So I don't know what the successful outcome is. Presumably, it's being able to kind of find on the military age males stashes of weapons or something like this. But they're, yeah, they're expeditions against sort of um, essentially against civilians, you know, uh, but civilians that might pose a threat in the future or something like this. So it's a kind of um, counterinsurgency sort of maneuver, you know. Uh, they've both failed, which suggests that those 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 things. We pay a small fee for them, uh, and manufactured goods, officers, conscript companies, a very small investment, representing, I suppose, replacements that you might receive on a small scale, small unit basis. Uh, we're going to keep doing that, though. We're going to keep running a kind of counter, in, a proper kind of much more integrated counterinsurgency in a western part um, of, I say colony, it's not a colony, it's a prospective colony, but the province sort of thing. The other thing we are beginning to do now, is drive up the development and colonial penetration of the Hajjaz, gradually, piece by piece. So uh, bribing operations, local chief bribing operations, improving road networks, um, and really those things in combination with each other. And this is a long-term operation that will begin to move towards the south um, of the protectorate. And we're going to be looking now, really, I think between now and, say, 1865, to lift the Hajjaz to co full colony status. This is also something we're, we're going to be doing with kind of... Um, Dubai, Qatar, and Bahrain. Um, these these locations are, I mean, they're protectorates, but yeah, they're, they're, they're a little way off, really, uh, us being able to do that, but not too far off, not too far off. The other area of colonial interest that we've begun to look at then is the island of Sumatra, and we're now beginning to develop a really, really decent commercial position here um, in Aiko or Aichia. It might be pronounced Aichia, I'm not too sure uh, whether it's a kind of an Italian-style sea uh, that's pronounced ch, I don't know. But in any case, uh, we began to develop trade posts. We've got a mission in the kind of capital, which is, uh, let's call it H for lols. Um, in Sibolga, uh, there's already a Dutch mission there, but we've got colonial merchants and we've got a trading post going in in two turns. And that is before the Dutch could really make their own kind of move for, to develop a trade post. So that gives us a strong trading position there. And in uh, Medan, we have uh, both a trade post and a mission. So we're getting a really strong position on the northwest part of Sumatra, but not limited to that. Uh, in Jambi, which the British currently control, again, we've got missions, colonial trade posts, colonial merchants, 
and we've got mi a mission being set up in uh, Bandaloon. So we've, we've, you know, we're starting to develop a really significant commercial position, which will yield meaningful colonial penetration, even in Asia itself at the moment. The Dutch have got 31%. I think they had 35%. That's atrophied because of us. We've got 13%. And this will continue to grow. Um, we want to look at inventive ways to try and increase our colonial pen penetration in Palembang, partly to force Dutch positions at atrophy, uh, to stop them really trying to make a move to protectorate status, which I think they'd be hard-pressed to do now because we've, we've kind of forced, we've weakened their position um, by increasing our own position there. But... If we can begin to get a position in Palembang, Bang, that'd be good as well. Another area I was looking at, it didn't occur to me. I had assumed the French position in really, I suppose, what was the kind of Vietnamese Empire, Cambodia, Laos, was much more substantial than it was. Actually, the French position is really limited to Saigon and really just this kind of corner, this southeastern corner, uh, with a little bit of colonial penetration. In So they've got to take over customs. Um, in Hanoi, uh, which gives them 38%. They're actually competing with China, the old kind of Chinese crumbling Chinese empire to the north. He's still able to throw a few punches of its own. And northern kind of Vietnam is, I mean, it's actually under, well, I say under military control. This is the Taiping, so it's part of also the Chinese Civil War. But you've got Hanoi, which is under Chinese military control. These are, these are only influenced territories. The other really spicy thing here is, if we look at, for example definitions of colonial status we can see how these areas are kind of compartmentalized into into kind of standalone colonial regions so for example we can see that sumatra is just a colonial region um, its capital is palambang but if we look at the old vietnamese empire this is much more decentralized we've got the kind of southern part here which is um coaching china uh uh, which has as its colonial capital Saigon. Um, the flags here are the, the flags of the kind of Vietnamese Empire. This is where the French have a bit more substantial colonial penetration, but not too much in the way of permanent structures. That's a key thing. Uh, it's mostly colonial merchants. Uh, they've got a trade post going in, in Saigon. That's the first of its kind, though. And then if we look at Cambodia, Cambodia is this area here. Not significant colonial penetration, but the thing that I'm really looking at is this central part, Hue Hue. Hue is the old kind of is the old capital of the old Vietnamese Empire, and this is only really comprised of two provinces. If we could lift colonial penetration here rapidly enough, and again, mostly French colonial penetration, but no permanent structures. Um, yeah. Oh no, I beg your pardon. They have a trade post in Hue itself. That's a shame. Um, but we could still get colonial penetration high enough here for this to become ostensibly, you know, possibly. I, I'm just fishing, I'm just sort of, you know, fishing through ideas here, really. I'm just thinking about maybe, is it possible for the Ottoman Empire to establish a position in kind of Indochina before the, uh, before the French do? Could we end up competing with France for these regions here? We should start looking at these areas that are not yet established, you know. Um, yeah, and that, that's basically these areas that have kind of these lines, you know. So we've got Malaya, for example, obviously an area of uh, British interest. But it's really Southeast Asia. I mean, like th this area here, Huawei, timber, tobacco, <coughs> silk, fish, small, but a really, really, you know, nice resource rich kind of region. Um, North Vietnam, a lot of rice, coal um, in Langson, iron, you know, desirable commodities. Um, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. And we've not invested anything yet. Sumatra, we kind of made the decision and very quickly invested a lot. We've invested a lot of private capital, state revenue, and that is beginning to yield results. It'll actually yield capital results. It will generate private capital as well as the kind of commodities that we want. Uh, timber, dyes, all these kinds of things. These things that we say, you know, uh, tea possibly, uh, additional tobacco, this kind of thing. So, the, yeah, these are, these are... We won't get a trade post here. That's a shame. But these are, you know, like this is an absolutely worthwhile exercise. In Sumatra, there's a good historical basis for it. But... I think, you know, we should keep an open mind, keep an eye on these things. I mean, actually, Burma is, at this point, only a british influenced territory. It's not yet integrated with the British Raj. You know, there's options. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll keep an eye. We'll keep an eye on Southeast Asia. The other area we're keeping an eye on, of course, is Tunisia. We're actually gradually getting good colonial penetration here. Like, we're really competing with the French. 
and Italians. We didn't really intend to do that. I think the reason being is because the local, the Tunisians are so kind of um, hostile to French and Italian presence. The French and Italians have upset them to such an extent that they just destroy uh, French and Italian um, provinces. You can see France has forcibly occupied Tunis and then is running a bribing operation. They basically have a military force here to stop their structures and a bribing operation can be interrupted if they lose control of the, of the territory, I think. But they're trying to establish a full-time military presence. They've even got an RGO, for example, in uh, Bizerti. So the French are taking a hard line and they're imposing their position on Tunis. But the good thing is, is if we, if we keep doing what we're doing, it will result in French colonial penetration atrophying. The key thing here is just to stop the Italians or the French getting the upper hand and trying to kind of maintain Tunisia as a bit of a no man's land, a bit of a buffer zone. And again, maybe in the future, even look to really kind of um, move to bring that into, into the fold. That's pretty much it. Um, went off a bit of a tangent at the beginning, but um, yeah, uh, eight years into the game and the first kind of first quarterly report for 1858. Uh, the next report, I guess, will be kind of mid to late summer, maybe August, September time, maybe a bit earlier, something like that. And, um, yeah, we'll report back on how the kind of military reform is going, how economic development is going, and hopefully also uh, we'll begin to see something a bit more interesting developing in Sumatra. I think one thing I'm going to look at doing is begin to prepare a small expedition of maybe marine, a marine brigade, something like this, and we'll look to see it. Initially get it um, set up probably um, in Basra, which is probably going to be the base, incidentally, of the kind of uh, the Indian, you know, the, uh, the Indian Ocean or the Persian Gulf stroke Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean fleet. Uh, but we'll get a marine brigade set up in Basra, possibly with a transport fleet, and then look to move it from there to establish itself in uh, in HL. So anyway, we'll sort of fall off that bridge when we come to it. But um, that's it for now. See you in the next video. Uh, thanks for watching.